So kommen Väter Josche, der Hossen ist ein neues Nam Sach und sogen uns Adrosche. Die Mama sagt, die Führung kommen, kräf im gute Gäst, in ungepackte Wegener, wie feiglach ohne alle. Oh, my God. 
Da 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 da. 
Well, it's really a pleasure to welcome you to SOAS and to the Brunei Lecture Theatre. So thank you for being here. Pleasure to be here. Thanks, nice Georgie. To, nice to be here. Thanks for having us. And um, I'd love it if you could tell the audience a little bit more about yourselves and introduce your music form. Well, I was, I was born at a very young age, uh, many weeks ago, in Cardiff, to, in a Jewish family. Um, searched for a, a, a style of music to play all my life and one day I heard Klezmer on the radio I was probably in my early 20s and decided that was the way forwards and the rest is is a very short but beautiful history <laughs> I was growing up on Soviet Union and when I was 16 I discovered that I had a Jewish surname so I started asking questions uh, what does this mean because we were all Soviet citizens. Okay. So uh, that's how I started to search for my identity. And uh, in, in, the, in the Soviet passport, we used to have this fifth line um, where we would put our ethnic uh, background. Okay. So I had, you know, I had choice to put Russian or Jewish. So I started asking questions. And then I, mm -hmm. I was just lucky to live in Kazan, where we had, a, it's a, the capital city of Tatarstan, a republic within Russia, central Russia, where we had a klezma band, one of the first, first bands uh, since Perestroika. So I went and listened to the concerts. I thought, well, I want to do this. Wow, I bet. So, you know, it all started then and here we are. And that's how I met Merlin. So what about that story? Yeah, how did you, yeah. you, you, you guys met through music? Yeah. I, I'd like to add something to what Paulina said about identity and music. It's very, very interesting, but one of the main draws of klezmer music, particularly to Jewish people, is to secular Jewish people. People are finding their roots and people are kind of identifying with the music mm. rather than with going to a prayer and a, a, a kind of... The, the synagogue, to me at any rate, as a child and every time I've been as a child, it offered a very gender-based hierarchy. Right. And I didn't like that, but I loved the music. And I think for a lot of people playing Jewish music, it's, it's really is a way in. A lot of, a lot of secular Jews, non-religious Jews, they find their way back to their culture. And they find the beautiful sides of, of Judaism, which is, I mean, the music's fantastic. Mm. Um, but a lot of the other stuff, to my way of seeing the world, isn't. That doesn't mean people can't get stuff out of it, but for me, it's it's this this is more interesting. And um, could you tell us a little bit more about this um, this first collection of songs? Because this is a wedding a, a wedding. Oh, the song cycle that we played. Song yeah. cycle, yeah. Uh, it's it's called Dihasana. It's a it's a, a cycle of poems uh, by Moshe Kulbach, whom I I consider the most depressive Yiddish poet. <laughs> uh, this, this was written in the 1920s, 30s, when he lived in Germany. And at that time, as we know, things were happening that weren't so positive. But also there was this new folk, uh, neo-folk movement. And mm -hmm. he wrote these poems exactly in the style of folk poetry. But guess what? It's a happy Jewish wedding where it's not a forced, arranged marriage. It's actually, they love each other and it's a rich house. There's lots of beautiful food on the table. Guests are arriving, bringing up homemade uh, jams and uh, ducks and stuff. And life is beautiful and they love each other and they even uh, caress each other's hand and how dare you do it. People can see it, but they love each other. So I just I just love the, the ring of it. So yeah. um, the music um, that I composed this partly traditional with some twists but I, I love that combination and having a cycle like this where one song moves into the next is that part of the tradition or is that something you've added yeah it's a, because his poems go one onto the next one I thought that would work for the for the vocal the cycle the actual, as well yeah the original yeah, yeah. Yeah. okay and then um so that kind of leads me to talk a bit about the the next uh, project which was the translation of stencil poems into music. Mm -hmm. um, could you tell us a bit more about that project? Yeah, <laughs> well, a couple of years ago uh, a friend of mine who is a Yiddish translator and interpreter, Asif Roman, who lives in Kharkov in Ukraine, sent me a few poems. I'm always in search for new poems for my songs and amongst these poems there was a stencil stencil poem um, uh, uh, Develer, which is one of the yeah, uh, songs, yeah. 
Uh, and I thought, that's, that's nice. I like the meaning. I like the, the language. And it was also written in the 1920s uh, in Leipzig or in, in Berlin, certainly in Germany when he lived there. And uh, so I knew the name. I didn't know much about the poet, mm -hmm. but I knew that he later moved to Britain. And then, um, then it came from you, you know, it came from you. Why not write uh, another song? And uh, the later poetry, the poetry that was uh, written in, in Britain is much more complex, uh, much more, there's, the, the words are beautiful. It's very, there's a lot of symbolism. There is a lot of, uh, hidden meanings and you can read one thing another thing into these poems uh quite difficult to write music to because there is no rhyme there is no rhythm right so it's, it's almost chunk. like speech but with lots of different beautiful imagery so yeah that so the 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 second poem was um halblevona which is half moon and i make references to the moon uh, sonata the you know beethoven so i thought I thought that was a good connection between something Yiddish lach, there is a bit of Yiddish mode there, and uh, classical because he was also kind of almost a classical poet. Mm. Well, it sounds absolutely beautiful. So you've done a lot with something that obviously was quite difficult and scanned quite, yeah. you know, yeah. awkwardly. <laughs> but it was a yeah. So the tell us a bit more about the composition sort of process. You look at the words and then you become inspired by a sort of sound that you hear or, or do you decide to kind of come from the musical side and then start putting the words to it? No, it's always uh, reading and reading and reading and then reading with piano and trying to put some chords and bits of melody to the poem as I'm reading it. Yeah. And it's more about the energy of the poem, uh, just the general, once I've caught it, I can just then write the rest of the song, but it's like this. Where do I take it? Is it quiet? Is it meditative? Or is it active and energetic? And do I want it to be in three? Or do I want it to be in five? Or do I want it to be in eight? Plus, I like uh, to use a little bit of Jewish element, something yeah. recognizably Jewish. So a little bit of modal, you know, some some twists that okay. would be, you know, give that flavor. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's come out really, really beautifully. Yeah. And we're very lucky now at SOAS because we're going to have these two songs, these original compositions in our archive as mm -hmm. part of the Stencil Poetry Collection. It's a, it's a, I'm proud. <laughs> We're proud. <laughs> <laughs> That's lovely. So the other, the other pieces that you've been playing this evening are um, traditional pieces that you, where you improvise on the stage as you're, as you're playing? It's, people often refer to klezmer as Jewish jazz, but it's not. Okay. It really isn't. Klezmer music, as, as discussed, is um, a traditional dance music. And the style of improvisation within it is absolutely tiny. Whereas okay. in jazz, you have melodic improvisation in, in earlier jazz. And then as, as jazz developed, the improvisation became vertical, meaning harmonic. So the players would improvise over harmony and use the chords rather than the melody as their, as their jumping off point. Whereas in klezmer music, the improvisation is actually closer to interpretation and it's more about ornamentation and phrasing. Right. So the melody generally stays intact. Mm -hmm. So you don't give each other too many surprises? No. The, well, we do. We do, <laughs> we, we do, but that's just for our own entertainment. Not <laughs> Keep each other on your toes. Yeah. But the melodies tend to unfold as the melodies were originally written. You can yeah. embellish, you can rephrase, you can put in little runs of notes, but really it's... It's a very, it's a micro, micro improvisation. And where do you learn these songs from? Do you teach them to, other, do you learn them from other musicians or do they come from sheet music that you have access to? A, a bit of both, but primarily I think learning style, you have to go to old recordings. And if you listen to the really old recordings, then the, the ornamentation and the phrasing come come in, they get into your blood, they get under your skin, so that when you eventually get to look at a tune on a piece of paper, you'll know how it should be ornamented and how it should be phrased without mm -hmm. having to... Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you said that recently more of these kind of archives have become available to you? There have recently been some pretty big chunks of, of early uh, transcriptions. They've been digitized and put online, so now we, we all have access to a, quite a big wealth of, of new stuff. Great. Quite a lot of it is the same as the old stuff. And also, this is only my opinion, so whether it's valid as, a, as truth or not, I don't know. But 
some of the songs, some of the tunes from this archive, the Kizagov archive, and some of the tunes from another archive, the Berikovsky archive, are the same, and right. slightly different variations of them. But I think there's a lot of stuff that's not really that interesting in them. There's a lot of tunes, there are many tunes that haven't survived in the repertoire because they're actually not that interesting. Okay. But there are a handful of tunes that are fabulous, and yeah. some of them are in both archives. So they there was stood the test of time. Stood the test of time and also stood the test of geography. Right. Because they were taken from quite a large geographical area yeah. and all put into one lump. In fact, that's something I wanted to ask about, was across the, ge the geography of Yiddish music, um, Klezmer, are there large stylistic differences or is it held together by a kind of overall style? That's a deep question. Uh, a lot of the original input into klezmer music was Hasidic nigunim right. and each region of Hasidim would have a slightly different way of presenting their so their songs and their their wordless prayers which are the nigunim mm. and from one re you can tell from which where, which ones come from which dynasties okay so there is the, the the ornamentation tends to be the same the ornamentation or at least very similar so ornamentation from um, from Kiev might be very, very similar to ornamentation from Kishinev. Okay, but you couldn't be like, oh, that's a Kiev sound, or you, you. You've... I think if you're, I think, I think people can. Yeah. Yeah, I think people can, and I think people really can tell musical structures. But underneath all that, there mm. is a core mm. ornamentation and phrasing style, right. and a vocal production style, and a instrumentation sound. Yeah. You know, there's a sound that instruments that people made on instruments a hundred years ago that they don't really make on instruments anymore. Mm. There became, I think, around the around the late '30s, actually a bit later, early '40s, when the three big record labels and Norman Lebrecht has written a book on this about opera. Mm -hmm. When the three big record labels standardized how music should be all this regional variation went out of music. Of and I think a lot of these styles and a lot of these things are only captured now on shellac recordings and mm -hmm. um, and cylinders. Okay, yeah. And anything that came later than 1948 is gonna be standardized. And your sound, given your very disparate sort of backgrounds? Hmm. The special, the, I don't know, because I actually learned the, I didn't really have a Jewish music background, klezmer music background back in the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. The way that people started playing uh, Yiddish music in, in former Soviet Union was quite quite shallow because we'd, we'd lost the tradition. Mm -hmm. So we actually learned it all from these guys. Merlin was one of the teachers who brought it back to former Soviet Union. Okay, wow. So um, now, we, now, because it's been, what, a couple of, two, three decades almost, since it came back and it's there's like a so-called revival of this music. Yeah. Former Soviet Union, Europe, America, America's for longer. Um, these cultures have gone in slightly different directions. So the new klezmorim, new players of this music in former Soviet Union play it closer to how they like it. Okay. Right? So it's a bit more of a popular style. Some of them are real traditionalists. And we have people in America playing it American style. And we have in you know, all these different styles, these which, new which have, yeah, forms yeah, yeah, yeah. And and it, yeah. it kind of gives, it, it's very positive because it kind of gives an indication that a culture is still alive. Yeah. If it's still different, if it's mm. different wherever it, wherever it lands. Right, right. You know, if, if it lands in America and the Americans add an American thing to it, then it shows a living culture. And that's a very positive thought. Yeah. Whether or not one likes the American <laughs> style or whether or not one likes the Soviet style is another question. Sure. And it has to fall outside of the argument. It's not really right. Valid. No, we like it. It's, uh, yeah. it's life mm. yeah. Yeah. and it's, vivacity. Yeah. 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 I wanted to ask you a bit more about your um, engagement with the sort of UK Yiddish music scene. Um, because I, when I started talking to Paulina about this stencil project, um, she pointed out some really interesting connections that, that you had personally with friends of Stenzel. I was a friend of Maya Bogdansky's. I don't know if you've come across him. He was a, a, an amazing... He was in his late 90s when he died, and he came from um, Pietrakov in Poland. He settled in London, I think, when he was 
50. He, he, he survived the war. His wife didn't survive. Uh, he came to Britain and he had so much going on in his head, so much poetry and so much music mm. that he decided, age 54, he had to learn to play music so he could write it all down. And one of the fr- he, he was the president of London Friends of Yiddish for many, many years. Mm-hmm. And one of the people who was also a member of the group was, was Stenzel. Right. So they, were, they became good friends. And I believe that Bogdansky set a lot of Stenzel's poems to music, mm-hmm. to his own music. Mm-hmm. Um, and he, he, he pointed me in the direction of Yibo in New York and said, all my stuff's there. I gave it all to, to, um, to Yivo. And right. if you want it, unfortunately, I don't have it in my flat anymore. But here's what I have and gave me a load of stuff that he did have. Oh. But Yivo have all of his songs. And I believe that many of the words are Stenzel's poetry. How interesting. But I never met Stenzel. He was already dead by the time I knew Bogdansky. Okay. Oh, well, that's definitely a, a path to go down to sort of listen to some more of those mm. recordings. Mm. Well, thank you so much for coming in. <laughs> it's been really wonderful working with you both and um, listening to your gorgeous music this evening. So I look forward to inviting you back and talking more and working further on these kind of questions. And thanks very much for supporting this culture and us musicians and carrying the flag of Yiddish culture further. Thank you very Pleasure. much.